Excellencies, dear colleagues, good afternoon to who is with us at the Basel Rotterdam and Stockholm Conventions meetings of the Conference of the Parties in Geneva. And good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to who is with us online or is now watching the video of this event. We have the pleasure to welcome you today for a new session of the Geneva Beat Plastic Pollution Dialogues, which have kept the international community in Geneva and beyond engaged on this topic since the end of 2020, making links with the United Nations Environment Assembly and other international processes, one of them being uh, uh, where we are today. This third series of the dialogues that kicked off in April is organized by the Geneva Environment Network in collaboration with the Basel, Rotterdam and Stockholm Convention Secretariat, the Center for International Environmental Law, the Global Governance Center at the Graduate Institute, IUCN, Norway, Switzerland, the Forum on Trade, Environment and SDGs, and the University of Geneva. The session today is co-organized with the governments of Switzerland, Uruguay, and the International Pollutants Elimination Network, or IPEN, and the Endocrine Society. To introduce you to today's event, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, IPEN co-chair Pamela Miller. Pamela, over to you. Thank you, Diana. We are so pleased, and thank you for attending today. And we're having this technical brief and panel discussion on health with all of you today, especially important given that the BRS COP is such an important venue regarding plastics with the Stockholm Convention addressing certain pops in plastics and then released as dioxins in the plastic life cycle and then with the Basel Convention aiming to apply controls on plastic wastes. Pops in plastics are a problem I think we all realize and there are many other chemicals that are also hazardous to our health known as endocrine disrupting chemicals that are also in plastic. So we are very fortunate today to have a leading health science expert to virtually help us broaden our understanding regarding, regarding the health threats from plastics. We welcome with hope the plastics treaty that is, that is emerging since the March 2022 UNEA decision to begin negotiations on a legally binding instrument. We believe that this demonstrates an increased attention to the harms that plastics cause on human health and the environment, including the use of toxic chemicals throughout the life cycle. The Plastics Treaty could become a new global health instrument that prevents the disproportionate effects that plastics have on human health and the environment for vulnerable populations and in low and middle income countries. As co-chair of IPEN, a global network of over 600 public interest and public health organizations in 127 countries, I am pleased to say that IPEN and its members are very active in this plastics treaty process and bringing our 25 years of global policy and technical experience on chemicals and health with the aim to make a new plastics treaty meaningful. IPEN believes that a plastics treaty is a global chemicals treaty and really a global health treaty. We express our gratitude to all the co-hosts that Diana mentioned and partners today who made this possible. The first session of our site event today will focus on the science and data regarding chemicals and plastics. The second session is a panel discussion with our distinguished panel from governments, UN agencies related to health, chemicals, and human rights. And now I would like to introduce Dr. Laura Vandenberg, who will be with us virtually. She is an associate professor at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst School of Public Health and Health Sciences, and also representing the Endocrine Society. And her talk today will focus on health, chemicals, and plastics. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you for having me. I'm sorry I can't be there in person, um, but I'm very happy to be here to represent um, endocrinologists. Um, the Endocrine Society is the world's largest and oldest society of basic scientists and clinicians that focus on hormone health. And there's over 18,000 of us around the world. Next slide, please. 
Um, just to disclose my conflicts of interest, my work is funded by the U.S. Institutes of National, uh, Inst National Institutes of Health, as well as um, numerous foundations. Next slide, please. So I'd just like to um, put this in context that a lot of what I'll be speaking about is written up in much more detail in this guide that was published in December 2020, which sums up our scientific knowledge of endocrine disrupting chemicals and uh, their origins and um, how they're leaching from plastics. All of this work um, comes from hundreds of peer reviewed studies and many, many years of research. Next slide, please. So let's get started by defining what are endocrine disrupting chemicals. These chemicals are defined differently by different agencies around the world, but the most simple and straightforward definition is shown here, that endocrine disrupting chemicals are exogenous chemicals, meaning chemicals produced outside of the body, or chemical mixtures that interfere in some way with hormone action. Most of the EDCs that have been identified to date can either mimic or block the actions of hormones. And most that have been identified alter the sex hormones or thyroid hormones. Although of course there's lots of other hormones in our body. Next slide, please. So I also wanna start by telling you why this is so very important. And I'm gonna give you a couple snapshots of conditions or diseases that we're seeing altered in human populations over the last several decades, all of which can be linked back to hormones or hormone action. On the left here, what you can see is the decline in the age at which girls are reaching menarche, receiving their first period. On, that's sorry, that's on the left. On the right is the decline in sperm count that's been documented um, around the world. Next slide, please. We also see an increase in the rates of endocrine mediated hormones, so, or sorry, endocrine mediated cancers, cancers that depend on hormones. On the top, what we see are the striking increase in the risk of testicular cancer across countries, but especially countries in um, Scandinavia. And in the bottom is the increase overall in the risk of breast cancer, which has been observed in countries from around the world. Next slide, please. We also see increased incidence in um, conditions that affect learning, behavior, uh, socialization. On the left, the increased risk of autism that's been documented in populations around the world. And on the right, the increase in ADHD, in this case, a study that was conducted in Taiwan. But this has been observed again around the world. Next slide, please. We also see an increase in the incidence of diabetes. The slide on the right is showing the increased incidence of type 2 diabetes which is often thought of as a lifestyle disease. And of course, we've, we've also seen an increase in the incidence of obesity in human populations around the world. What's also shocking is what's shown on the left, the increase in type one diabetes that's been documented in populations around the world. Type one diabetes or otherwise known as juvenile diabetes is also influenced by immune function. And we're seeing that also increase around the world. Next slide, please. So these are just a few of our most concerning issues, cancer, reproductive problems, alterations to other hormones, alterations to growth and development, brain and behavior. And when we see these striking increases in disease over periods of time where genetics could not possibly be changing, we're talking about just a couple of generations in humans really tells us that we need to start paying attention to what's going on in the environment. And endocrine disrupting chemicals is one very important part of this equation and is of course of interest to those of us who study hormones. Next slide, please. So there are many endocrine disrupting chemicals that are found in plastics. And these endocrine disrupting chemicals have been linked to reproductive disorders, cancers, diabetes, obesity, neurological impairments, and many other conditions. These links come from human studies where we're looking at human populations and comparing between highly exposed and less exposed populations, but they also come from controlled laboratory studies, including the kind of work that I do in my lab with rodents. Next slide, please. 
A major concern that endocrinologists have raised is that endocrine disrupting chemicals pose risk to human health at key points in life cycles, including during pregnancy and puberty and childhood. Another major concern that we now know, based on studies largely from animals, is that the effects of endocrine disrupting chemicals can be transmitted over several generations, which means that the time to consider the effects are as early as possible. Next slide, please. So as we wrote about in our report released in late 2020, there are many, many different chemicals or classes of chemicals that are found in plastics that have been linked to health effects. I don't have time to talk about all of these this morning, but I do suggest that you read that guide. Um, it's freely available online through the Endocrine Society and IPEN's website. Next slide, please. I'm just going to focus on these three um, classes or groups of chemicals because I think they're of greatest interest to this audience here today. Next slide, please. So I'd like to start by talking about UV stabilizing chemicals. These are chemicals that are added to plastic products as well as other products to prevent against damage from harmful UV rays. They're also added to plastic products and other products to prevent the product from fading, to provide it with um, stain resistance and color, res um, color resistance, to inhibit corrosion, and to minimize fogs. Next slide, please. One of the chemicals that's used as a UV stabilizer is UV-328. This is a chemical that's raised a lot of attention recently because of its environmental persistence. It's been detected in environments where it has never been used because it's moving um, throughout the planet uh, and depositing itself in, in places where um, humans are not typically found, um, where manufacturing is definitely not found. Um, it's also been measured uh, in the bodies of many different wildlife species and in human breast milk. There's evidence that this chemical has anti-androgenic behavior, so it is an endocrine disrupting chemical. And it is just one of many UV stabilizers that have been shown to be endocrine disrupting chemicals. My lab is studying another one, oxybenzone, that's also found in plastics, and it alters the development of hormone sensitive outcomes. Next slide, please. We're also interested in brominated flame retardants. We know that plastics are flammable and therefore flame retardants are added to plastics. Brominated flame retardants are one of um, a diverse family of chemicals that are used to reduce the flammability of plastics and reduce the likelihood that fire could be spread through them. They're used in plastic casings for electronics and electronic equipment and furnitures and in building materials and children's toys. Some brominated flame retardants have already been included in the Stockholm Convention for Restriction due to their persistence, also because they're bioaccumulative and they have toxic properties, but many are still in use. Next slide, please. The health effects of brominated flame retardants are very well documented. Because these flame retardants are not bound to plastics, they can leach from the products throughout their entire life cycle. So exposures to humans take place for, via inhalation and ingestion of dust and contaminated food. Children are known to have higher levels of brominated flame retardants in their bodies compared to adults, which is likely due to the, the, the large amount of hand-to-mouth activity that children um, use and also the use of recycled plastics in toys. Exposures to brominated flame retardants are associated with altered thyroid hormone action, which is very critical to the development of the brain. These compounds can also disrupt sex hormones and interfere with the development of the male and female reproductive tracts. Next slide, please. Bisphenol A is the third chemical um, that I'd like to just spend a moment talking about. BPA is found in many different kinds of plastic products and it leaches from these products, which means that a lot of our landfills are um, full of BPA leaching, which contaminates surrounding soil and water. It has been listed as a substance of very high concern by the European Union and has been demonstrated to be toxic in hundreds of animal studies and more than 100 epidemiology studies. Next slide, please. There's extensive evidence that BPA affects a wide range of health outcomes. Specifically, BPA impacts brain development and behavior, reproductive health, and it is a known carcinogen. Next slide, please. 
There are also many BPA substitutes. So as BPA exposures themselves appear to be going down in some populations, especially in areas like the United States and in Western Europe, Instead, BPA is being replaced by chemicals that have similar structures shown here from left to right are BPA in the center bisphenol S and on the far right bisphenol F. These are just two of dozens of BPA replacement chemicals and many of those chemicals as they started to be studied in greater depth have been shown to exhibit the same health effects as BPA. Next slide please. EDCs are present in plastics. That's, the, that's really the big part of the story here. And there's about 275 million metric tons of plastics that are used each year around the world. And only a small percentage of these plastics end up being recycled. Whereas many other plastics are incinerated or they end up in landfills or in the oceans. This means that EDCs and plastics are being introduced to all of these environments. Next slide, please. What we now know is that EDCs are used in the building blocks of plastics, and they're also used as additives in plastic products. They're contaminating our worlds around us, which means that we can expect that they're going to affect our health. They already are. Next slide, please. We absolutely cannot ignore the connections between plastics, endocrine disrupting chemicals, and our health. There are real life health impacts that are already occurring today that have been documented in human and wildlife populations, and therefore action is needed to prevent further harm to these populations. With an increased production of plastics, which is expected over the next several decades, we can expect increased exposure of humans and wildlife to endocrine disrupting chemicals, which also means that many of the health problems that are already associated or been shown to be caused by exposures to EDCs will likely become much worse. There is no sustainable way of dealing with plastic waste, including the chemicals that are involved in their production and the chemicals that are released from these plastics. Therefore, prevention is key. Next slide, please. Just like to thank the co-authors of this report. And again, welcome you to um, read this report and remind you that it's found um, online and you can access it for free. Thank you for the time here today and thank you for the invitation to speak to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Vandenberg, for this very enlightening presentation that really informs and inspires us to take urgent action to institute protective policies. We really appreciate your time today and your expertise. And just noting that the chemicals that have been highlighted from Dr. Vandenberg's presentation are found in plastics in the food web across the South and will now be discussed by our next presenter, Griffins. So it's my great pleasure to introduce Griffins Ocheng. He is with CJAD, Center for Environmental Justice and Development, based in Kenya, and he's also the IPEN Plastics Working Group co-chair. He will present some very interesting new data from Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Griffins, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Pam, for the introduction, and good afternoon, everyone. I said, um, I co-chair the IPEN Toxic Plastic Working Group, and I will share with you data or studies that IPEN has conducted uh, on this topic. And first, maybe just to give you a, a brief overview of IPEN. IPEN is a global network of public interest NGOs, and uh, we have a mission for a toxic free future, uh, free future for all. Uh, we have members of uh, 600, uh, of NGO, mainly NGOs, uh, across 127 countries. And as said by Pam, we have over 25 years of experience in treaty negotiations, which started with the Stockholm Convention, as well as uh, currently uh, with, with SICAM as well. So I would first maybe just give an, a background about uh, health threats uh, from plastic toxic chemicals. Uh, so every stage of, uh, of life cycle of plastic is associated with hazardous chemicals. If you look at extraction, uh, which is of carbon uh, to production, as well as use uh, and recycling, and even the disposal of plastic, uh, which has different types uh, in terms of plastic fuel, dumping and landfilling, and the global dumping in the glo uh, of plastic waste. So in all this uh, life cycle of plastic is associated with some hazardous chemicals. And I will take you through uh, each stage uh, of the life cycle. Phase one, uh, which is the production of plastic or pellets. Uh, if you look at plastic materials life cycle, uh, we've done studies uh, that uh, 
collected uh, uh, pellets across uh, 22 coastal locations in Africa, America, Asia, and Europe. And the result of this study, uh, we found that over 100% uh, uh, contained uh, chemical PCBs polychlorinated uh, by, by phenols and UV stabilizers. Over 50, uh, rather 50% of the locations had highly uh, or extremely high PCB levels. And so uh, the next, uh, in terms of phase two of the production, we still see plastic uh, or rather bisphenol A, plastic material products contain uh, the ones that were tested, the baby toys bottles had 78% uh, of the products that were tested, 61 of the samples labeled were labeled BPA free, but still contain the BPA chemicals. And this data is from uh, Bangladesh, uh, Bhutan, China, and the countries that are listed here. Also, uh, if you look at uh, the phase two, uh, still within the plastic material life cycle, we have PFAS, uh, material, plastic material products. These include clothing materials. Uh, we had 84% uh, of the materials that were tested at PFAS uh, from data from China, Indonesia, and Russia. Uh, we're also lo looking at the phase three uh, in terms of recycling uh, of plastic. So the recycled plastic materials, uh, mainly the recycled platelets, add uh, chemicals, uh, flame retardants, UV stabilizers, and the bisphenol A. And these were collected across 24 locations in Africa, Asia, Europe, and Latin America. 100% of these samples uh, contain one or more of the three substances that I've just mentioned. 84% uh, of the samples contain all the three substances. Uh, we also looked at uh, look, uh, uh, data on recycled plastic products uh, for brominated flame retardants, 100% of the materials that tested showed uh, burned brominated uh, flame retardants, the penta, and the octa, and the KBDE. And this is data also from China, Indonesia, and Russia in a study or a project that uh, IPEN has been conducting. When you look at the recycled material products, particularly in products, uh, we've tested a number of plastic uh, items or plastic products. Uh, which are made of recycled plastics. 72% uh, of the products that were tested had exceeding levels of pop, uh, uh, pop weights over 50% uh, ppm. Nine out of 83 samples had very high levels of brominated dioxin levels. And these were data from the countries that are listed on the, on the slide. So all these data have also been uh, you know, uh, uh, published in a peer-reviewed journal. And uh, which shows the recycled plastic toys can expose children to dioxins. And this is a uh, particularly contribute to daily dioxin intake uh, in children. Uh, when you look at the disposal uh, of plastic, uh, the end of life toxic emissions and releases, particularly from local communities, we've tested uh, eggs, uh, egg samples uh, in areas where plastic is burned, uh, the incinerators, and uh, the review of this data, especially from open burning uh, cement kilns, these, we have data from Africa, Asia, and, uh, and the Americas, and 92% of the eggs that were sampled uh, near the incinerators were having uh, levels of dioxins uh, above EU health standards. So just recently, we had this uh, publication, uh, which was in the margin contaminants that was released on 26th of May, 2022, uh, that showed the monitoring of dioxins and PCBs in eggs as a sensitive indicator for environmental pollution and contaminated sites, especially in areas like incineration sites, chemical recycling, and cement kilns. So in a nutshell or in summary, we say that plastics poison the circular economy if you look at the data that we've generated. And so this is a big concern, especially the linkage of chemicals, health, and, cons uh, and uh, plastic and, and chemicals. So I would want to invite you to the data, uh, the reports that IPEN has pu published uh, uh, based on the data that we've generated that is available some of uh, here and also at IPEN booth. Uh, so feel free to pass by. Thank you very much. Thank you, Griffins. Thank you. And I just wanted to let everyone know that the, the guide that Dr. Vandenberg referred to is um, available at the IPEN booth. We have copies here as well and in all UN languages at the IPEN booth. Thank you, Betty. <laughs> and then the reports that Griffin's also referred to are uh, 
also available at the IPEN booth. Okay. In order to swiftly orient you all on how toxic chemicals can cross borders without controls, we have produced a short video that we'd like to share with you today. So we'd like to turn to that, please. Hazardous chemicals are entering Africa in plastics. In Senegal, Bintu cooks an egg for our son Ismaila. In Bintu's town, plastic waste is banned in the open. When plastic waste is burned, it pollutes the air with toxic chemicals. These chemicals fall into surrounding soils, poisoning the chickens and their eggs. When Bintu serves this egg to Ismaila, she has no idea how much damage it might cause. Where did all this plastic waste come from? Most of it comes from other countries under the guise of recycling. But Azada's chemicals are also exported to Africa, embedded in new plastic products. In South Africa, Lubanzi buys a toy for his daughter Kaya. What he doesn't know is that even some brand new plastics can have toxic chemicals in them. Many countries regulate the Azada's chemicals in this toy, but don't regulate what goes into exported products. Kaya's new toy contains BPA, phthalates, and flame retardants. These toxins are absorbed by Kaya's body as she plays with it. While the plastic industry insists their products are safe, only about 1% of the chemicals on the market today have been tested for toxicity. Global plastic production is growing rapidly and is expected to triple over the next 30 years. Unfortunately, research has shown that many of these chemicals can cause serious health problems. These chemicals are linked to cancer, developmental and neurological damage, and reproductive harm such as infertility. African families and government officials assume new plastic products are safe, but have very little access to information about the toxic chemical additives used to make the plastics. Once these chemicals enter in plastic products or plastic waste, the problem grows. Unfortunately, recycling plastic is not a solution. It can be a ploy to enable hazardous waste dumping in Africa. Investments to turn plastics into fuel or burning it create further health and climate problems. So how can we protect Africa and Africans? First, we need global controls on hazardous chemicals in plastics. We need to end foreign recycling efforts that export the hazardous plastic waste and hold the plastics producers responsible for the hazardous chemicals they add to their products. We need exporters and African leaders to stop the flow of hazardous plastic and plastic waste into African countries and protect the health of all Africans. Africa's future must be protected. This video focuses on Africa but it is obviously relevant to all countries regarding toxic chemicals crossing borders in consumer products with no information about what is in these products. The reason is that the ingredients in plastic products are not labeled or known to the public. The plastic products are a passport then for toxic chemicals to enter into countries. And now it is my honor to introduce my IPEN co-chair, Tedessa Amera. And he is also director of Pesticide Action ne Nexus Pan Ethiopia and will serve as the moderator for our distinguished panel this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, my co chair Pam. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, I'm also pleased to introduce you, uh, our panelists. Uh, our first uh, panelist is Mr. Felix Vertery, uh, who is the head of uh, Global Affairs Section uh, for the Federal Office uh, for the Environment of Switzerland. Uh, our second panelist uh, is Ms. Uh, Valentina Sierra, uh, Permanent Mission of uh, Uruguay to the United Nations uh, in Geneva. Uh, our third uh, panelist is uh, Mr. Sheikh uh, Ndiani uh, Sila, 
uh, who is uh, the director of uh, the Ministerial Cabinet for Environment and Sustainable, Sustainable Development uh, for the government of uh, Senegal. And uh, our fourth uh, panelist is Mr. Marcus uh, Orellana, uh, UN Special Rapporteur on Toxics and Human Rights. And uh, our uh, final uh, uh, panelist is uh, Mr. Richard Brow, who is attending uh, virtually, uh, who is also Chemical Safety uh, and Health Unit, uh, Department of Environment, Climate Change uh, and Health uh, for the World Health uh, Organization, WHO. Thank you all the panelists for attending. Uh, my first uh, question will go to uh, Felix. Uh, we have been saying that this treaty, especially the plastics treaty, is a health uh, and a public health and chemicals treaty. Uh, and in your view, how can the plastics treaty help control the use and exposure to hazardous chemicals in the life cycle of plastics? Felix, please. Thank you very much and good afternoon to all of you. I would first like to thank IPEN for organizing this event. I think such kind of exchange is really important. We have taken a big step by adopting the UNEA resolution. But also we know that it's also a new field, a new kind of treaty. So we need information from science, from NGOs. So that's all we very much appreciated. Regarding your question, so we know that chemicals are in, uh, a part of plastic. No, we are more than 10,000 chemical substances are used for plastic production. And I think the first element we need, we need more information, better information about types of plastic, um, what is in plastic, which kind of additives are in which kind of type of plastic. That would be kind of a requirement that we can also then better think about which use is appropriate, how can we recycle it, how can we uh, how have to treat waste. And then we talk about recycling, for sure we talk about circular economy. So we have to increase recycling quote of plastic. We talk about nowadays we have about 10% of plastic is recycled. I think as you have also shown in the documents, we have talked about a safe and non-toxic recycling, recycling. And again, here, requirement is information available so that we can properly deal with those um, different types of plastic that they even are able to be recycled. And I just learned yesterday a new term, a new word, this upcycling. I don't know if you know that, but I can give an example. My colleague Valentina, she has this bag here. <laughs> and this bag is made of old plastic bottles. And that is what is called upcycling. So you use waste or plastic waste to create a new product. And that is a great idea. But again, here, for sure that we, are, that we know that this is a safe product, we have to know what was in the plastic we use, basically. So it's about recycling and also upcycling, because that's for sure also something that we have to promote to use waste for new kind of products. So what can we do um, in the new treaty? And I think one of the questions will be what type of treaty will we have? Now we will, in our view, we need, a, we need a treaty that has control measures so that we can also look what's in the plastic and also can restrict, ban, regulate certain additives. That would be a basic for the safe circle economy. In the presentation, we have seen UV 238. I think that's a good example. It's also related to the Stockholm Convention. It's one of the substances that are going to be discussed in the future. We have also seen in the video a link to the Basel Convention, plastic waste exports. It's also an amendment of the, of the Basel Convention taken at the last COP um, on plastic waste shows what the BRS conventions are example of what we can do to enhance the safety. Um, I think also that the BRS conventions can be an example how a treaty can be designed or elements of a treaty could be designed. We know the system of annexes where we treat with different kind of substances that, it, it, that need different kind of treatments. Um, I think that could be also be an inspiration for a new plastic treaty that we could use this kind of element with the annexes where we can regulate, ban or restrict certain substances. Do I have more time or do I have to stop? <laughs> Good. I'm let me make one more. I think also we have to create incentives. No, we have this kind of extended produce responsibility. 
because we also know from the BRS experience, it is not always easy to go substance by substance in a multilateral area. So we need additional elements. We have to work, for example, with standards, label, certification schemes. We have to think about how we can use them, promote them, ensure the quality, avoid greenwashing in a multilateral setting. And here comes linkages, for example, to the private sector, because they have a lot of knowledge, they have a lot of systems in place. We can't replace that in a multilateral treaty, but we can use it and hopefully promote it. We also have a lot of examples on national level. I mentioned, I mentioned, for example, extended produce responsibility. Many of our countries, we have schemes where we try to promote the circular economy through those. We can learn from each other which kind of substances we try to limit or to promote through those systems, what kind of how we apply those. Those might be different to the context or in a developing, developed country, island state, landlocked state. There might be different tools that we can use. But I think also that we have a good overview of what we have at the moment on national level will help us to think further what are the best tools, how we can promote them, and which are most appropriate for our context. Thank you. Thank you very much, Felix. Uh, you raised uh, important issues about the historical event at UNIA 5, uh, and which is opening uh, a new door to a new treaty. And uh, as you uh, already mentioned, we need science. That's what IPEN is trying to do, to bridge the issue with the science and bringing evidence. Um, and also uh, non-toxic circularity. If in the circular economy, if we do, if we are taking in uh, toxics, the, 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 the toxic chemicals are circulating and we are increasing their circulation. So this should be uh, non-toxic circularity. And recycling and upcycling also is something that we can take. And uh, EPR, uh, EPR uh, to be incorporated and also the annexes in the, in the uh, treaty like the Stockholm Convention, which strict uh, the use of uh, chemicals, hazardous chemicals in plastics. Thank you very much. And uh, with this in mind, uh, Valentina, what's your reflection on the first question about the circularity and preventing the hazardous chemicals for health? Thank you very much, Tadese, and many thanks uh, to, to IPEN for organizing this important event. Um, and it's, it's a pleasure to share, uh, to share it with these uh, distinguished panelists. Well, to start, I would like to highlight that UNEA uh, 5.2. Um, at UNEA, we agreed to start a process, uh, a negotiating process, with the goal to complete our work by the end of 2024, a legally binding agreement on plastic pollution that addresses the full life cycle of plastics and it includes the, mar the marine environment. I would like to highlight the main elements that are included in this resolution and uh, that are relevant to chemicals. Uh, firstly, uh, the recognition of the problem uh, and their negative impacts on the environmental, social and economic dim dimension of sustainable development. It is important to emphasize the dimension of plastic pollution prevention and uh, its related risks to human health, as well as the adverse, adverse effects on human well-being and the environment. We consider that the negative impacts on human health, on the environment and on human rights should be reflected more clearly in the future agreement. Hazardous chemicals are used during production, consumption and waste management, and that should be also discussed in this process and considered in the treaty. These are indivisible, interrelated and cross-cutting issues, and they should be addressed jointly to improve their core benefits. UNEA resolution recognized that plastic pollution needs to be tackled, tackled throughout uh, the life cycle approach. But we still need to have a common understanding of what we mean by a life cycle approach of plastics. Also, I would like to highlight uh, the importance of the multi-stakeholder forum that will be, will be take place uh, in the first INC and hopefully during the whole process. It will be a great opportunity to learn more. Uh, we encourage all stakeholders to participate, including the private sector, so we can have a deep understanding on how uh, the plastic sector works, how the life cycle is like, where the producers and the consumers are located, 
as well as the geographic scope involved in the plastic waste management. Finally, we encourage the participations of the participation of NGOs without restrictions, also uh, of the BRS and SICOM secretariats, of the academia, scientists, the health and labor sectors, workers and informal workers, and youth representatives. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Valentina. Yeah, uh, as we said, fire, UNIA 5.2 really uh, created that opening. And uh, the problem is now already recognized and how we can solve the problem uh, is under discussion from the OEWG uh, in Senegal to the INSCs that are coming, which is going to start in Uruguay and continuing uh, for the next uh, two plus years. And the life cycle approach is uh, very important and the multi-stakeholder approach and the, the draft decisions taken also in uh, Dakar on participation was also uh, encouraging for civil society and other stakeholders as well. Uh, having said that, I am coming back to you again on uh, uh, this issue of uh, the non-toxic non circular economy. Uh, what uh, guiding principles should be adopted to achieve a non-toxic circular economy uh, for plastics? What's uh, your opinion? Please. Thank you, Tades. Uh, indeed, uh, I think we, we should uh, highlight um, some principles, very, very guiding uh, principles, actually, that, that needs to be, um, they will help us to achieve this non-toxic uh, circular economy. Um, first of all, uh, also, there are highlight and present in the resolution, um, well, are the reference uh, to sustainable production and consumption of plastic, sound management of waste, uh, and circular economy. For us, this is fundamental, and, and it, it has to be included uh, in the treaty. Also, I would like to highlight the social aspect of the resolution because uh, it recognizes the significant contribution made, made by workers under, in, under informal and cooperative settings. And it also highlights uh, the health impacts on waste speakers. Uruguay also promotes this approach under the ILO. Uh, we also heard that chemicals in plastics um, um, chemicals in plastics make plastics less recyclable. So it's a thing that we, we should address. And we need to eliminate as much as possible the toxic chemicals in plastic production to have a non-toxic uh, circular economy. Finally, sustainable alternatives and technologies are also um, highlighted in the resolution. And um, they also highlight the need for enhanced international collaboration to facilitate access to technology, capacity building, and scientific and technical cooperation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Valentina. This is uh, very important. The solid waste management and the circular economy, the non-toxic uh, circular economy issue is very important. Is the social aspect, especially waste pickers were well represented in Dakar and the health aspects, the social aspects of uh, the waste pickers is uh, also something that we uh, also focus on um, and all this to be incorporated in how the chemicals the hazardous chemicals cannot be included in plastic production is uh, also a point thank you really so much and i come uh, to uh, shaksila now uh, with the same uh, question uh, what's your reflection on what guiding principles should be adopted to achieve an toxic circular economy for plastics? Uh, because you are, you were chairing the plastics uh, OEWG in Dakar, you were hosting us, and you know almost all the processes that, that have been taken after UNIA 5 in Dakar. And uh, what's your reflection on this? Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for the opportunity uh, to IPEN uh, Switzerland and Uruguay for hosting this. And uh, I hope uh, uh, the African leader will heard you about the video because uh, it's a very difficult uh, subject. Uh, a non-toxic uh, circular economy can only be achieved if there are no toxic chemicals added uh, to plastic or if the toxic added will not affect anyhow the health and environment throughout the life cycle of the plastic. In countries like mine, 
and uh, in many African countries also, this is very difficult to achieve due to the early reuse of the plastic by informal sector, which is the most developed on the ground. When I say early reuse, it means, for instance, the plastic used for packaging. Uh, and uh, these this plastic uh, are cut into small pieces and used for packaging uh, foods such as peanuts, salt, paper, and so. Also, non-food plastic also are used at checkout to package oil, vinegar, uh, mustard, all is sell in plastic continent. And uh, most food uh, packaging does not meet the characteristic required to, for food contact with plastic. Any plastic and on handy can be used or reused in addition to some goods like bags, shoes, books, smell uh, oil or solvent when you use it for the first time. There is a high risk of additive entering food causing all kinds of illness, including cancer, throughout the absorption, absorption and accumulation into the body. It's uh, why all plastic must be designed for recycling, so that no plastic is burned, dumped, or landfilled, knowing we cannot recycle the plastic uh, indefinitely. Although the new agreement should address the issue in the country level and or regional level, specific regulation must be taken also and duly implemented is our hope. In the framework of the new convention, uh, I say convention, but <laughs> let's say agreement by the time being, the definition and adoption of standards are very key. From many side events we hear here, we saw how recycling of plastic containing Toxic chemicals, including pops, are threatening the lives in Africa, Middle East, and elsewhere in the world. It's why we stand ready to develop the new agreement on plastic pollution, taking, taking into account our local context to address the issue that can be solved only globally. And uh, one last thing also with regards to the circular economy, we are not only importer, but all our country we are producing uh, this, uh, this plastic. With regard to the technology transfer, we must take care of the dumping of non-clean equipment and see how better we can do the recycling and disposal of the plastic. And to end, our hope is a new agreement address all our expectations within the five uh, ink uh, meetings and hope also protecting health and environment will guide us uh, during our negotiation and discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Sheikh Sila. And uh, this really ref reflects also the African situation. Uh, Africa is overwhelmed by the, the plastic pollution, as has been indicated in the film. And the packaging, the food contacts, uh, and the high risk that we have. And you clearly indicated that it should not be burned. We already have the pollution and we are aggravating the pollution by burning them. And the definition of standards in non-toxic recycling and appropriate technology transfer and capacity building, these are the main points that are required for Africa and for uh, the, this treaty also to look into. Um, thank you very much again. And uh, now I come to you, uh, Marcus. Um, looking at all the discussions that, you, that we uh, see and uh, linking this treaty, uh, this um, agreement uh, with other uh, agreements, with other conventions, what are existing laws and gaps uh, in international law in relation to recycling plastics? with hazardous chemicals, which is related to the Stockholm Convention, and uh, trading of plastic waste, which is also uh, linked to the Basel Convention. What's your reflection, Marcus? That's a big question. Thank you. Thank you, Tadese, and thank you to IPEN uh, and uh, all the conveners of this space uh, for the invitation. I am really pleased uh, to uh, join you here this afternoon. 
As you may know, the uh, Toxics and Human Rights Mandate was created uh, more than 25 years ago now to deal with uh, the transfer of hazardous wastes from the global north to the global south. The Human Rights Council eventually in time reframed the mandate to deal with chemicals and wastes in a life cycle fashion. Why do I mention this from the start? Because the first mandate holder, uh, Ms. Fatma Sorosentini from Algeria, in her first report uh, to the then Human Rights Commission, identified sham recycling as a pathway of uh, the transfer of hazardous wastes uh, to um, the global south. Uh, now, we ha may have this image of the uh, smoking green drum in a, in a ship, but the video was very telling of these vessels carrying the recycled products. So this is the new challenge of a, what is now a decades, thank you, old, uh, old problem. So now to your question specifically, uh, it, you may know that uh, I presented a report on plastics and human rights to the General Assembly last year. That report analyzes the legal landscape in international law of instruments that concern the plastics problem. Now, what the report found was a high degree of fragmentation, either because of regional scope or spatial scope or subject matter. So if we look at, for example, the regional seas conventions that have done such good work, they have a regional scope and thus things fall through the cracks because there's no comprehensive uh, instrument. If we look at the spatial dimension, there are instruments in the uh, International Maritime Organization, such as MARPOL, that concern vessels. And so when vessels get to port, we see a limitation there of what happens downstream. And if we look at subject matter, there are instruments that are defined by the characteristics of the chemicals they cover, such as Stockholm Convention, as you mentioned, Tadese, on persistent organic pollutants, we know that some additives that are harmful for humans, uh, for their, our health and for the environment, they're not necessarily POPs. So then things fall through the cracks there. And then when it comes to subject matter in the Basel Convention, we have transboundary movement, so trade, waste, focus. But as Valentina rightly point out, the problem is not just one element in the life cycle or death cycle of plastics. Uh, it is more about the comprehensive uh, stages. It's uh, production, transport, uh, use and waste. Uh, so in the use segment or dimension, we see that the Basque Convention does not necessarily reach that. It concerns one stage of the, uh, of the cycle and thus things fall through the cracks there. All of this leads to fragmentation and thus the need and the importance of a global new instrument that addresses comprehensively the plastics threat. In addition to the issue of fragmentation, there is the concern specific to the uh, Basel Convention about loopholes that are enabling the transfer of plastics to the south, uh, not just north-south, also south-south, um, because of uh, what is considered to be uh, a repairable uh, product or, or substance or, or thing. Uh, and so the, the streams of waste that uh, are shipped uh, under this uh, loophole, they have impacts on, uh, as we know, they're dumped, they're burned, uh, much like other plastics. They contain hazardous substances as well, but they're not being covered by the Basel Convention. It, this is rampant. Um, so this, these are uh, some reflections on, on the specific question. And if I may indulge, uh, Tadesi, with uh, your indulgence again, uh, if I could comment on, on the point that was made by Felix just now, the, um, the, it is indeed the case that these instruments and others provide useful models or elements to build what could be and what is expected to be an effective instrument to deal with, uh, with plastics. And the point about restricting additives is essential. Uh, this is, was pointed out also uh, as an element of a non-toxic circular economy. The annexes model could very well work here Perhaps national action plans are not that effective. That's a longer conversation. I'm happy to elaborate. But 
What about thinking about, instead of annexes that include chemicals that are, are to be restricted, what about reversing that and include annexes that, or provide for annexes that include uh, those chemicals that can be used? Uh, and that could then enable what could become then a, a, a truly non-toxic circular economy. That's just one reflection. Thank you again, uh, uh, Tadesa. Thank you, Marcos. Thank you. Um, it's really very important. The fragmentation, the loopholes that you indicated, and the restriction of hazardous uh, chemicals uh, from adding into the plastics production. That's why we are uh, saying that plastics should be seen as materials, not as products. And if we are dealing as materials, we go to the top. Uh, if, we would, if you don't close the top, which creates the mess, uh, and if you are dealing only with the mess, the top flows, and you end up just cleaning and cleaning, and you end uh, all your resources and time in that. So there should be a mechanism also to close the tap there. And your your point on, and Felix's point also on restricting hazardous chemicals from being added in plastic production is the green designing aspect that we are all, also uh, working on. Uh, now uh, I come to uh, Richard, Richard Brown. Uh, we are saying that uh, this treaty, this uh, uh, plastic treaty is a, a, a chemicals and public health treaty. Uh, and uh, as uh, a WHO person, what are the opportunities for plastics treaty to protect, to protect human health and the environment. Uh, when you see the progress uh, from UNIA 5.2 and uh, OEWG and also the discussion in the BRA scopes here. Uh, Richard, please. Uh, thank you for the, uh, for the question, uh, for this opportunity. The, I see from the, the instrument that comes, and this is a personal opinion, I can't speak for, for the whole organization, uh, but two areas of potential for improvement in the area of research and and as a mechanism for disseminating information on chemicals because there is a lot of uncertainty in this area uh, the who has 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 looked in particular at one aspect of plastics which has not been mentioned so much today and that's the area of microplastics we published a report in 2019 on occurrence of microplastics in drinking water and the result of that was found that there was a great deal of uncertainty in how to do an assessment of the effects of microplastics in drinking water and a need for more research in order to resolve those uncertainties and that can be extended to to other areas related to the health effects of plastics uh, I would like to mention that we have followed up on that drinking water report with a, an additional report, which hopefully will be published within the next one to two months, looking at microplastics in other media, such as air, uh, via food, via contamination of soil, uh, effects via ingestion and inhalation. Uh, and while the report is not available yet, I think it is almost certain that it will be it's unlikely to be able to conduct a quantitative risk assessment because of these continuing uncertainties about all of the assessments which can be done due to, to lack of information. So I would hope that a, a new international instrument of some kind could help to stimulate necessary research to help resolve those uncertainties and identify what are the most important concerns, as well as the overall aim of stopping the rise in plastic like pollution, which has been seen worldwide. Uh, when our first microplastics report was published, our director, Dr. Maria Nera, made an explicit statement that, that it should represent a call for action to stop the rise in plastic pollution taking place uh, worldwide. And I would hope that this instrument could very much help to stimulate 
uh, action um, in that direction. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Richard. Uh, and uh, thank you very much also for raising the, your study, the WHO study on uh, uh, microplastics, which uh, is also an input for the for the future studies. Uh, and now the treaty, when we, we started discussing about plastics in the, uh, in the very beginning, it was about microplastics and ocean pollution. Now it is going beyond that and uh, not limited to microplastics. And uh, as the two presenters also already uh, did uh, we we have lots of studies also beyond the microplastics and we hope that who will also uh, engage in those studies and also the edc's study is frustrating and also some evidences and in peer-reviewed journals uh, which are coming are also some concerning uh, issues which we believe that uh, WHO will also uh, engage in that process and validate also that process. Thank you. Thank you really very much, uh, Richard. Now uh, I pose this same question to uh, Felix. Um, what are uh, the opportunities on this uh, to protect human health and uh, the environment? Thank you <clears throat> very much. I think the first of all is that we have to fully understand that health is part of the treaty. And one way to do this is also that health is well, well mentioned in the objective of the treaty, like we also have it uh, for the BRS conventions. I think we start already highlight at the very beginning when we talk about what is the intention of the treaty, that the human health is part of it. I think also that we have to associate in the process important international organizations like the WHO to provide further information. So you have heard an example about the work they do on microplastics. I think that would be very important. I think that's also a general point that we have. Now we have a new system to get out of the silos and support enhanced cooperation, in particular from our point of view, for sure, in the field of environment and health. I think also there we have another UNEA resolution that has been uh, adopted, I think uh, Valentina has mentioned it, the one on the science policy panel on chemical space and pollution, that is also focusing very strongly on this cluster of environment and health. And that really, I think, is a general point that we have to emphasize this, and also science policy panel could then also further inform the, 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 the development of the treaty. I think it's also to be established, so it would not be yet for the negotiations part, but it could be part of design on it to bring in also these two elements of environment and health. I just also think very simply that an effective treaty would reduce the use of plastic. And the reduction of plastic is already a contribution to the human health under the condition for sure that we are sure that the alternatives used are better. So not to duplicate the problem or replacing the problem, but find better alternatives. I think that will be very key also to be sure. I think it's also the scientists at the very beginning who said prevention is key. And I think that's really the chance that we have is this plastic treaty. If you have not uh, an effective treaty. It is a unique opportunity that we can use the plastic produ production. And perhaps the first question that we have to ask ourselves is, where can we easily reduce the plastic use? What are the low hanging fruits? And I think we know all from our daily lives, we see the absurd examples where we use plastic and we would not use it. And this kind of thinking through, we have to for the whole value chain. Where can we replace plastic by something better something else, where could we just reduce it? And then for sure, that was uh, already what have been mentioned by myself, many others, we have to take into account this uh, question of hazardous addi additives. I think if we talk about health, we have to talk about the, the chemicals that are in plastic, and we have to find a way how to deal with it, to reduce the use and to get out or to, to, to reduce at least um, the, the, the hazardous additives that are harmful for the environment and for the health. Thank you. Thank you very much, Felix. The health part of the treaty is very important, which we have to work in the coming uh, INCs. And uh, the hazardous chemicals that are added to plastics should be minimized or avoided so that we can know where to use plastics and where to replace them 
and uh, replacing plastics with non-regrettable uh, replacements is uh, something that we can take on. Uh, having said this, thank you very much, uh, our panelists. Uh, I would like to give uh, the audience, if you have uh, questions to the panelists, you are very welcome. You tell us who you are and where you are from. Okay. Thank you very much. I am uh, Omar Sisse from Mali. So I have uh, two questions. The first one is uh, addressed to the first intervener who talked about uh, endocrine uh, disrupt disrupting uh, uh, chemicals. So my question is, at which stage of the life of the hormones, the hormone disrupting chemicals are established to be harmful? First one, is it on the glandular when producing the hormones? Second, is it on the hormone when produced as such? Third, or on the function of the hormones? It's a, a particular, these are particular questions. So the second question, uh, oh sorry, also second question for the, the first intervenant is, are there uh, identified specific endocrine disrupting chemicals linked with disruption of identified hormone or hormonal system. Uh, I think that uh, she get me. So my last question is for uh, panelists here present and uh, especially to to Felix because he uh, he speaks on uh, circular economy. Uh, Felix, do you? have any idea on how to link the EPR to the circular economy in developing countries, uh, specifically in uh, plastic waste management? I uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we would like to have a reflection uh, for these questions and uh, you will be the second. Uh, first, uh, let's have a reflection from uh, Laura, uh, hopefully uh, she is online. You have, or oh. no? Okay, so we will organize to, to uh, answer those questions. Yeah, uh, and the second question for Felix. Thank you very much for the question. Um, one element what we have done in Dakar, we have established a list of documents that we ask the secretary to provide further information for the treaty. And one of the questions is what are the national measures what are implemented at the moment to, to work on the plastic pollution? And I hope when we get these documents is that then we, I can better respond to your question. Because at the moment, I think that's one of the questions that we also have. No, I think we have to gather more information on experiences. I know that some countries, I have heard some examples, are using it to a more advanced, perhaps already kind of a tool. And I think what is interesting in the EPR system is that this can be a, a dialogue, also discussion with the private sector. And it's also a tool to steer which kind of plastic materials, plastic types, um, we, we want to encourage to be used or, or disencouraged because you can then also work with kind of the fee structure. And this can also involve our time. It can also grind, set this kind of um, the setting where then also the private sector knows what is coming. You can also work with, with, with time slots that can also be increased certain fees, for example, over time. So it allows also then kind of the private sector to adjust and to adapt to these kind of structures. I think also if we can address this question on a more global level, it can also be used to reduce trade barriers. So it can also be an incentive uh, because it can also facilitate, for example, in certain trade or certain also selling in products when there are similar systems in place. Thank you. Thank you, Felix. Second question. Hi, good morning. Um, my name is Arancha Tedillo. I'm speaking on behalf of the Global Alliance on Health and Pollution. I would like to ask a question to Mr. Marcos Orellana. Buenas tardes, Marcos, here. 
Um, you say earlier uh, in your presentation that uh, you believe that health national plans might not be as effective to tackle this global plastic crisis. And I would be interested in he hearing more about that, to, if you could elaborate. And also, what would be the alternative solutions that you propose um, for that? Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, other questions? Okay. Uh, thank you very much. I am Youssef Zidi from Tunisia. Uh, just, uh, uh, we know that uh, inside of the gas emission, uh, uh, coming uh, from the plastic uh, uh, incineration, there is another uh, uh, mechanism of transformation that gives more risk or more dangerous uh, when we use the plastic. What is exactly this mechanism? And uh, I think it is a physical and chemical transformation. And uh, if we, we need to, uh, to resolve the, the plastic uh, problem at the beginning, at the top. Uh, it is possible to, uh, to, to, to uh, make uh, some, some uh, modification or transformation on the process production or on the composition of the plastic in order to, to will be uh, less dangerous on the health of and the environment. And thank you. Any other question? The last one, okay. Or, and then two, okay. Again by you, WHO. We have seen that plastic is a real problem, that all the presented, presenters acknowledged it. We are now working on a treaty, and my question is, one, uh, which mechanism will be in place to ensure monitoring of implementation of the treaty? And do you already have some thought as to enforcement for the observance of the treaty? Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, thank you. Uh, my name is Charles Ikea from Nigeria. Um, when you are talking about uh, non-toxic circular economy, and in this case, I'm referring to um, plastics. Now, if you want to uh, make the product less toxic, probably you start from the design stage. You try as much as possible to design out waste, that's reduce waste, design out pollution, of course, design out, you know, um, toxic chemicals. Now, how do you balance? Because it, it is possible that if you reduce um, the toxicity, it, it might affect the durability of the product, which would also impact on its reuse, repairability, um, recyclability. So how, how do you balance, you know, when you reduce um, such uh, chemicals and then you are not talking about the circularity of the, the, the product, you know, wouldn't it affect its circularity, particularly um, when there are no credible or alternatives. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, Dr. Dada, last. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the presentation. Um, I was at Senegal last week, and I would really like to commend the organizers and the government of uh, Senegal for a job well done within a short time. Quickly to the reference by my colleague from Nigeria. Presently, we have over 50 replacement on of um, 
product in producing plastics. Limestone by Japan is still, I think it's still under research. And so many products, over 50 types of replacement. But my main worry is that in the design of the um, convention, will those products still will be under plastics or for instance, limestone is going to replace some of the products in in um, in making of the plastic, whatever. So those are the things we need to consider, because when they do replace them, what volume will be replaced, and can we still classify those as plastics? That's where I'm really worried about. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the questions. Uh, now I <clears throat> proceed to the panelists to re reflect on that. <clears throat> and for the last uh, two questions that are coming, very, very important points about uh, green designing and uh, uh, how we can uh, depend on these products. So what, what, what are we measuring? Human health and the environment or the product or the material is something that we are doing. And if science reaches to produce those plastics, science should also reach, I mean, the, 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 the industry should also reach to the level that can produce uh, materials that are not harmful. Because when we are talking uh, EDCs, I always remember one intervention uh, from one of the European countries uh, some years back, uh, you mean you are less mean than your fathers and grandfathers was a touching statement. And endocrine uh, disruptors are like that. So we are taking about our future generation on how to deal our future generation uh, when we are talking about uh, green designing and these chemical uh, chemicals taking EDCs as an example, and there are also other effects. Having said this, I will give the floor to our panelists who want to reflect first. Maybe Marcus. Okay. Thank you, Tadesi. I'm, I'm happy to go first with a specific question on national action plans as an element of treaty design. The NAPS, for the acronym, they're quite uh, attractive uh, to many because of the uh, flexibility they uh, provide to cater to national circumstances. But are they effective? If we look at uh, different treaty regimes, uh, say the climate space with, uh, na with nationally determined contributions, uh, kind of an analogous uh, to NAPS, uh, the pledges and commitments there are overshooting uh, the Paris Agreement goals, uh, according to the UN Environment Programme's uh, re most recent assessment, the GAPS analysis, um, shooting to 2.7 Celsius and beyond. So are they effective? Big question mark. Uh, on the specific point that you mentioned in the, uh, in the Stockholm Convention, national action plans are used to uh, address uh, unintended uh, POPs the most recent reports on the effectiveness of the Stockholm Convention on this? Do they contain any figures that can document uh, and uh, uh, put uh, numbers to uh, UPOP reductions? They do not. Uh, the, so are they effective? There, the, uh, the obligation is to elaborate on a national action plan. There are elements of best available technology, as, as we know. But um, there's, uh, if incinerators uh, are expanding, the total volume of unintended POPs will, uh, will increase. And so there is a question of the effectiveness of the instrument. Finally, uh, because of time, uh, if we look at the Minamata Convention that uses uh, national action plans to deal with uh, small scale mining, small scale mining is the largest emitter of mercury to the environment. Uh, have those figures been reduced? The uh, specific provisions of Minamata are not to eliminate mercury, they're to uh, reduce, uh, but uh, as we've seen, these national action plans uh, are, have been very slow to, uh, to come out of the ground. So in the absence, to, to conclude this point, in the absence of clear global objectives and clearly defined standards, national action plans may not be particularly effective as a tool.
Thank you, Sheikh Sila. Uh, thank you very much. Maybe to compliment uh, Carlos, uh, with regards to uh, national, uh, Marcos, I say Carlos, so I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, uh, with regards to the national action plan, because uh, this uh, common convention uh, agreement must uh, uh, allow country to have uh, data, like uh, inventory of uh, plastic, which kind of product you, you, you import. Uh, which kind of of, of uh, plastic you produce, and how is the life cycle in, in, the, in your country, uh, and uh, looking of uh, uh, the circular economy, and uh, that uh, the, that give us the opportunity also to talk about the financial mechanism. You know, we have uh, many different financial mechanisms that that you, we can compare. And uh, one of the most uh, beautiful for me, or I don't know, is a good financial mechanism is the Montreal Protocol. You know, uh, going coming from a country program, it's like your national action plan. How you can fund your national action plan? And uh, this one, I know that uh, developed country don't want anymore to have uh, such kind of uh, Montreal Protocol because it's a little costly. But that is a way where we can uh, address uh, all things and to have the obligation on reporting. But uh, because reporting is very important. And uh, if you report on uh, with regard all of what you are doing, what you are producing, how it is uh, sell imported, uh, exported also, we can uh, see uh, how we can, how far we can reduce in the world, in the global uh, environment the plastic and how uh, we can address the gaps and, and so and uh, i think uh, it is a way to tackle this uh, new agreement also to have uh, after the national action plan a regional approach because uh, africa is a very specific uh, compared to other continent and uh, i think it has to be taken into account thank you thank you Shikzila. Like to reflect? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, perhaps also on the monitoring question from the colleague of WHO. I think also we have in the chemicals and waste um, resolution examples. I think because monitoring, reporting, compliance, effective evaluation are very important. It's also interesting that the uh, that effective evaluation of Stockholm has been mentioned as an example where perhaps we can see lack of progress. But we can say the effective evaluation was at least helpful to acknowledge that, to see that, and also provides the basis for, for further work and hopefully improvement. I think also that we have in the Minamata Convention good examples that we had were able to incorporate all of those elements. And I think when we continue in this path, I am confident that we're also able to incorporate those important elements in a new treaty. But also perhaps to let to say that this has not been discussed in depth now. I think that we'll start now at INCN1. We will start about discussing such kind of elements. About the financing, um, I agree with Shai Xil that we'll have a discussion about financial mechanism. That is for sure part of it. I think also that we have to think beyond the kind of financial mechanism. No, we have to think about, as it was also said, we have to stop at the top, not that not more plastics come in, so not, not to create more problems over time that will require more financial needs also. We always know when we don't address a problem over time, the costs are getting higher. So all that you can do to prevent the problem further, I think that will also be a part of uh, saving uh, funds and resources in the future. And also we have to find mechanisms to stimulate innovation for better products. We have to find mechanisms that support the transformation towards the circular economy. All those elements will also help them to implement it, but not that uh, everything would then be financed by public funds, but rather to create a system that also allows this, this transformation um, and implementation of the treaty. Thank you. Yeah, Valentina. 
Thank you, Tadesa. Just a final point that I think it's, it's important to raise, um, that UNEA also recognized the, the urgency to strengthen the science policy interface. And, and, and the resolution on, on the plastic, the future plastic agreement, also opened the possibility to establish a scientific committee. For instance, it could be as, as uh, similar as CRC or POPROC. Um, but also we, we are having, we are starting a parallel negotiation process on the SPP, the science policy the science policy panel uh, on chemicals, waste and pollution. And we could do also a, a good use of that panel um, related to this issue. We, uh, they, can abroad, they, they can address more broadly uh, this issue as well as um, identify the alternatives and technologies that we could use in the future. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Valentina. Richard, do you have any reflection? Um, I would make the points, in, well, two points. Uh, the, the hazardous uh, byproducts produced by incineration uh, of plastics can include uh, dioxins, and WHO is actually conducting a re-evaluation of its, of its toxic uh, effect, equivalency factors for fire dioxins to enable assessments of the effects of dioxins to be brought up to date. That's happening later this year. I wanted to mention in when it comes to design, the design phase that in when establishing the relative cost of alternatives, it would be preferential if the health cost of using something was incorporated within the overall cost of the use of that substance, because the immediate cost may be higher. But when you take account the long term health effects of something, its overall cost may be lower. And I would like to think that that would be taken into consideration when developing alternatives. And my final point would be to look out uh, from WHO for the next few months to see our report on, on the microplastics, which will, will be published. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Richard. And I would like also to give the panelists uh, what uh, takeaway message do you have for the audiences? Uh, I will give you 30 seconds to give us uh, punchy messages. And uh, to use uh, Richard's presence, I, I would like to start from Richard from the health perspective. What key message do you have to tell us? You have 30 seconds, please. I don't need the 30 seconds because my final point was to look out for our microplastics report for the the media outside of, of just drinking water. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Felix, what key message do you give us? <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think we have a unique chance opportunity here. It's really something that is a milestone in the international environmental governance. And I really hope that we get it right. And I think one thing also here at the BRS, we also see that sometimes we design a convention with a good intention, but then also we see over time that the mechanism is not working as we have hope, we hope for. An example could be the, the challenges with listing under the Rotterdam Convention. So we have to be aware that if we design the convention that we are careful, that we have a that we, we can live up to the expectation, but also think about this kind of mechanism, because they will be very decisive about um, uh, what we can also then uh, to develop further the convention. And this said also about the process. I think that the convention or this treaty that is coming is not replacing existing efforts. We have now two years, the ambition is to have two years negotiations, but it would still meet the entry into force of the treaty. It would be about 2029, 2030. So it takes a long time to establish this instrument. So I think also we have to continue working already with what we have to try to beat the plastic pollution. And then also, because when we have the treaty, it will take time till it's really full functioning, then we have to adjust it already. That's those things take, takes time. So Michael will also be not to, to only relate on the treaty, but also continue other efforts. Thank you. Thank you, Felix. Valentina? Thank you, Tadese. Well, from my side, I think three three key aspects I would like to highlight. First of all, to have a successful result on, on this treaty. First of all, a multi-stakeholder engagement, a broad participation, and political will. That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
Shaisila? Like uh, Valentina, in the last uh, point, uh, uh, the major group uh, well engaged and uh, we heard the, the major group because uh, uh, negotiating only for state uh, sometimes uh, we, have, we refrain to tackle uh, uh, effect, uh, effectively the issue and uh, not leave uh, nobody behind be together and uh, work together and uh, i hope that uh, this treaty will allow this engagement thank you thank you sheikh Sila. Uh, marcus thank you thank you Tadesse. i, I would uh, reflect that uh, given the grave toxification of the planet we as humanity need to change trajectory and that means a change in paradigm uh, and that means moving to a non-toxic environment. And the, this, uh, these negotiations on, on plastics offer a very good opportunity to do that. And in order for, those, uh, for the instrument to be effective and legitimate, a rights-based approach is critical. Uh, these are elements of just transition. It is also a question of putting people in vulnerable situations first, such as children. We've heard earlier about endocrine disrupting chemicals. It means securing access to information, as we've also heard in the panel on additives. So it's not just access to information, however, it is also control. It is uh, the restriction of toxic chemicals that would otherwise harm uh, the possibilities for a circular economy, not to mention even human health and the environment. Thank you. Thank you, Marcos. Uh, Griffins, our uh, co-chair for the IPIN uh, Plastics Working Group. Uh, do you have any key message to take home? Um, maybe just to give thanks, a vote of thanks to all the partners uh, that have worked together to make this a reality. I mean, uh, as IPIN continue to you know, elevate the issue of chemicals, health through generating data. I think this has been critical in bringing such kind of conversation into policy making process like the INC. Uh, I remember when this issue, uh, probably in uh, UNEA 3, when the issue of plastic pollution started uh, with momentum, uh, the conversation was more or less on the issues of waste management towards, um, you know, and recycling. But over time, uh, now the conversation has really elevated on uh, when we were in uh, Dakar as well as in UNEA, we have had such kind of sessions to bring information and, uh, you know, science on the issue of health linkage of uh, chemicals and plastic. So I think this is a very good conversation as we move into the INC process. And uh, thank you all to the partners uh, who have made this reality. Thank you. My co-chair Pam, you, you are from Alaska and you have the Arctic experience. What do you have uh, to tell us? Thank you, Tedessa, and thanks to all of you for your thoughts and, and thought-provoking discussion this afternoon. I just want to offer my personal perspective as a researcher who conducts community-based research in the Arctic on endocrine disrupting chemicals. And we know that the Arctic is a hemispheric sink not only for chemicals and pops, but now also for plastics and chemicals that are conveyed into these remote regions in plastics. And we also see that these, these chemicals and plastics are contaminating the traditional foods of the, tradi of the indigenous peoples of the Arctic. Climate warming is exacerbating the mobilization and transport of chemicals both into and within um, the Arctic and we see chemicals and plastics that have been sequestered in sea ice glaciers and in permafrost now being released into some of the places that are most productive from, from an ecological perspective, but also the places that are very important for traditional fishing and hunting of the indigenous peoples of the Arctic. So I just wanted to highlight this because this is not an abstract issue. This is a critical public health issue that we must solved together and there there's an extreme urgency to this so i hope we can all come together and in these next few years negotiate a very strong treaty based on health and human rights thank you
Thank you very much. Uh, this discussion doesn't end here. We are here until the end. And today also we will have another side event on plastics and refuse uh, driver fuel, uh, which is another way of exporting plastics to others and uh, to other countries in room 14, level two. Uh, having said this, I would like to thank our presenters uh, and panelists. Thank you so very much for your time and very valuable information uh, at the very beginning of this discussion uh, which is going on for the last couple of years and we hope that we will get uh, a better result in the INCs and in the treaty thank you very much and we end the, our our plan here thank you <laughs>